Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first I would like to make an announcement. Uh, the chairperson of this session is not Dr. Klini. You can learn it from my accent. It's Hebrew English and not Italian English. Uh, Dr. Klini is a great friend of the Porto School of Environmental Studies, a great friend of Israel, but unfortunately he had to cancel his visit. We hope to see him soon again here in Israel. Well, uh, I'm Hudi Benayau. Uh, I am uh, at present the head of the Porter School of Environmental Studies. Uh, I am a uh, professor of marine biology at the Faculty of Life Sciences here at Tel Aviv University. Uh, let me start with a short introduction. As the head of the Porter School of Environmental Studies, I am delighted to welcome you all here today. Uh, Dr. Uh, professor Hagit Yaron Messer, the Vice President for uh, Research and Development at Tel Aviv University. I hope that Dame Shirley Porter, uh, who is the founder and the donor of the school, will join us soon, unless she is here. I can't see her here. <clears throat> I would like to say a few words about the special structure and mission of our school, the PSES. The PSES is a unique type of school, not only at Tel Aviv University, but also in Israel. We work with all nine faculties and different disciplines at the university, promoting multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary view of the environment. We believe that this approach is vital for providing solution to today's environmental issues. At the PSES, we run educational programs with more than 100 MA, MSc, and PhD students and hundreds of undergraduates across the campus. Some of these courses are dealing with the field of renewable energy. The PSCS is actively involved in renewable energy initiatives and projects. For example, we participate in the Global Bioenergy Partnership. We have cooperation research with renewable energy with the Italian Ministry of Environment, Land and Sea, which provides funds for this purpose and I hope that the PSES will become a key player in the renewable energy supercenter to be established at Tel Aviv University. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to invite the first speaker of this session, Professor Yogi Goswani, who is John and Aida Ramil Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of South Florida a co-director of Clean Energy Research Center at the University of South Florida. The title of Professor Goswami's talk is going to be New and Emerging Solar Energy Technologies, Challenges and Opportunities. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's indeed a pleasure for me to be here in Israel. Uh, Israel is the country that uh, showed leadership to the world as far as solar energy is concerned, and, and I'm uh, very confident that Israel will again show leadership and resolve in making solar energy the energy of choice uh, uh, for Israel, and the whole world will follow. So with that as the background, uh, I was asked to talk about uh, uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, before I actually talked about challenges and opportunities, let me put this in context. Last night you heard uh, President uh, Shimon Perez talk about uh, the need for solar and renewable energy from the point of view of security of the country. In fact, security of all countries. Then <clears throat> Vice President Al Gore talked about the need for solar and renewable energy from the point of view of environment, that in order for us to have clean environment, in order for us to survive in the future, that we need renewable energy. I will probably come to the same conclusion as they did, but from a different angle. So <clears throat> let me talk about uh, the global situation. When we look at uh, the energy consumption uh, of the world, whether we look at the data from uh, 
1800 to 1990, or more recently from 1970 onwards, one thing is very clear from it, uh, and that is the average annual increase in energy in the whole world has been about 2%. So no matter which you, you look at, whether it's 1.9% or 2.1%, it's been close to 2% per year. So the U.S. Department of Energy projects that in the future also, the energy use of the world will increase at the same rate, that is 2%. However, if we look at the actual data from 2001 onwards, and I got this from the BP Corporation, their report, and I don't expect you to be able to read any numbers in there. The important thing is what I'm going to point out, and that is looking at the energy use from 2001 to present, the average annual increase is not 2%, it's almost twice that. And Part of the reason, or maybe the main reason, is Asia-Pacific, where the energy increase averaged over the past six, seven years at 8.6%. If you look at China, the average increase is more than 9%. Now, if you look at 2003 to 2006, that average annual increase is actually increasing. So, at least for the next few years, foreseeable future, that our average annual increase in energy in the world is not going to be 2%, it will be more like twice that. But even if we say, well, we take an estimate of 2% annual growth per year for the whole world, even then the energy use will double by 2037 and it will triple by 2057. Keep these years in mind, because I'm going to look at it based on how much we're using today, not even considering how much we will need in 2037 and how much we'll need in 2057. Yeah. So <clears throat> looking at how much we are using today and where that energy is coming from, it's very clear. <clears throat> 86% of our energy comes from non-renewable fuel sources. 80% of that, 80% from fossil fuels, and about 6% from nuclear. That percentage has been at that level for a long time, and many people expect that that percentage will continue that way in the future, but you will see in a few minutes that that's not sustainable. So, looking at the fossil fuels first, looking at oil resources, this is the actual data. I've taken data for oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear, from groups and agencies that are actually advocates of those resources. So, in other words, they present that data in their best light. So, I'm not taking any sides there, not taking my own data. Okay. So world oil reserves, the International Energy Agency says, well, we have 1,266 billion barrels. BP says we have 1,200 billion barrels. There's slight discrepancy, but they almost agree with each other. So looking at that as the proven oil reserves, the production rate of oil today is 80 million barrels per day. Now you divide one by the other, and you find out if we do not increase the production of oil, all of these oil reserves would be gone in 41 years, which means around 2050, if we don't change oil use from today, by 2050 there will not be any oil left. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there was a geologist, famous geologist, geologist in USA, King Hubert, who predicted long before 1975 that U.S. oil production will peak at that time, and he was right on the money. And his methodology, we have applied that here, and we said, well, let's say we don't have 1,200 billion barrels, we have 2,000 billion barrels. 
well then we probably peaked already in 2004 even if we have uh, three times what the actual reserves are at this time the proven reserves even then it's only a few more years before oil production peaks so it doesn't matter whose estimate you take the US Department of Energy says well we have anywhere between 2,000 and 4,000 billion barrels and they also agree that 4,000 billion barrels is really more of wishful thinking than actual and so we're going to peak in oil production and that means we cannot continue to do things the way we are doing okay. then people say okay there's something got corrupted here <clears throat> that well natural gas will take the place okay now the proven reserves of natural gas are about 180 trillion cubic meters. At 2004 production level, the reserves to production ratio was 67 years. That means if we did not increase the use of natural gas from 2000 onwards, just kept at the same level, then we have enough natural gas for 67 years. However, the production of natural gas has been increasing at an average rate of 2.5 percent over the past four years. Okay. So at that level, all of the natural gas will be gone in less than 40 years. Okay. So that brings us to about the year 2050. Okay. So <clears throat> then we say, well, uh, what about uh, nuclear? Nuclear should save us. Okay, again, this has got co corrupted. Uh, here's the situation about nuclear. Known reserves of uranium are anywhere from 2.3 to 3.2 million tons, and, and this is based on data from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Yeah. And our present world nuclear capacity is 368 gigawatts. We know that to produce one terawatt hour of electricity, we need 22 tons of uranium. So you do, again, divide one by the other. Even if nuclear power increases at the rate of 2% annual growth, which will not be able to keep up with the total energy growth, even then, all the nuclear reserves, uranium reserves, will be gone by 2030 to 2037. Well, U.S. Department of Energy says that uh, the actual uranium in the ground may be more and if the price is high enough somehow we will find that even their upper limit which is 5.1 million tons if you consider that then at this rate two percent increase per year all the uranium reserves will be gone by 2050 now keep in mind though that if we do reprocessing of the fuel then the reserves will last longer However, reprocessing makes it so expensive that, that that may not be the choice that people want to make. And at the present time, it's illegal to reprocess in the U.S. So with that in the background, the only one source that left is coal. Now, <clears throat> looking at coal, okay, now this whole thing got corrupted. I'll tell you, <laughs> the, the total reserves to production ratio of coal in the world is 174 years. Now, that's a long time, 174 years. Okay? Uh, that is with the present uh, production rate and the reserves that are known, all the discovered and undiscovered. But if you have an increase, the way it's increasing today, with increase in China and in India and some of the other places, 2.5% uh, per year, the coal reserves will be gone maybe in about 100 years. Now, even if they're not gone, coal comes with disastrous consequences. So you, you can <laughs> make out what this means, <laughs> but I can tell you what it means, that uh, coal will come with disastrous consequences that we are not willing to live with. Okay. So <clears throat> with this in the background, <clears throat> The German Advisory Council on Global Change, they looked at uh, our energy needs of the future and where the energy will come from, and they came to a conclusion that by 2050, 50% 50 of our energy will have to come from renewable energy. 
Now, theirs is based on a, a different argument. But you looked at the data just now, whether it's oil, natural gas, uh, nuclear. By 2050, we really have no choice that at least 50% of our energy will have to come from renewable energy. So, <clears throat> that being the case, <clears throat> we have to look at uh, what is the status of renewable energy and, and where the challenges are and where the opportunities are in there. Okay. So, <clears throat> I will not go through all of these resources, uh, just give you an introduction uh, starting with wind, uh, because you hear a lot about wind. That's the fastest growing renewable energy resource uh, today because uh, wind turbine technology was developed to a point where if the resource is available at a location, the, uh, the technology is cost effective at that location. So <clears throat> today, the world wind capacity exceeds 94,000 megawatts. Okay? And the average annual increase from 2000 onwards has been close to 30 okay. percent. So <clears throat> now coming to solar, because that was the main topic that I'm supposed to speak at, for. Water heating is the, the most developed application, and, and people in Israel don't need to be reminded of that, uh, because I can see that on the roofs of every building, solar water heaters, although this picture is not from Israel, this is from China. And uh, here, the reason I put that in there is for you to look at that the solar water heating collector sales have been increasing at a rate which is over uh, close to 25% per year. But the point I want to make here is the red part of the bars, all of that is used in China. Okay. Now, that is tremendous. And that, that's one thing to explain, that if you want to take over the world market, which China is about to do, as far as low temperature solar collectors are concerned, then you first need to create market in your own country to perfect the technology and then go overseas, reduce the cost. And so at the moment, uh, all of Latin America is importing from China. Uh, uh, a lot of the collectors in USA are imported from China. Ish, in rest of Asia, they're imported from China. And, and eventually, uh, they will be so competitive that nobody else will be able to compete with them. Looking at other applications, I'm going to only talk about two. Uh, somebody said uh, in this morning's uh, uh, talk that uh, our preferred form of energy is electricity. So I'm going to look at only solar electricity production by two ways. One is solar thermal power, where we understand this conversion of power the most, because all of our power plants in the world are thermal power plants, except that uh, the fuel source is different, whether it's coal, whether it's nuclear. In this case, uh, instead of that source, we use concentrators, solar concentrators. And what you see here, is three types of concentrators. One is uh, uh, the parabolic trough, and then we have the parabolic dish, and then central receiver, and I'll show you examples of all three. Okay. Now, this shows uh, central receiver type of power plant where we have uh, uh, these flat mirrors that reflect sunlight. They may move throughout the day, such that the reflected light is concentrated at the top of this tower. So uh, that's where you create high temperatures and the rest of the cycle is the same as any other thermal power plant. The second I mentioned is a parabolic dish where you have a parabolic uh, reflecting dish which reflects sunlight and concentrates at its focal point, and at the focal point, you can have any kind of heat engine which converts that heat into electricity. In this case, it's a Stirling engine which converts uh, heat to mechanical power, and then generator converts that to electrical power from there. 
The third type is the parabolic trough. Now, this is the technology that has the most experience behind it in terms of operating experience. That uh, as early as 1990, 354 megawatts of capacity existed in Southern California. That's what was uh, established there by Luz Corporation. Okay. Then interest went away for a while for uh, reasons not related to the technology, but political reasons. However, recently there is a resurgence of interest in the technology, and approximately 3,000 megawatts is under construction uh, at this time in the world. And just in one country, in Spain, more than 2,000 megawatts is already either planned or under construction. And uh, what you will probably hear maybe this year, next year, year after that, I hear that from various governments, and that is uh, that significant new developments are expected in a number of other countries. So, so this technology is about to explode. The second <clears throat> solar electric technology is photovoltaics. And that's a technology that uh, I think uh, as late as uh, uh, 1995, the photovoltaic panels would not produce enough energy to pay for the energy that took to produce them. And at that point, especially in 1980s and early part of 90s, many people said that forget about this technology, don't put any more money in it. However, the technology continued to improve and something else happened. That is, the applications became uh, so suited to this technology, such as the building integrated photovoltaics, where photovoltaic panels replaced certain component of a building so that the cost was not actually what you paid for them, it was that minus what you would have paid for the component they replaced. Okay. So that made the panels cost effective. Uh, and at that point, architects got involved and they made to, uh, photovoltaics integration into buildings look beautiful. Okay. So more interest developed. Uh, these are just some of the examples of uh, uh, photovoltaic integration in the buildings. Something else happened, and that is uh, started with Germany with the feed-in law, and a lot of other countries, uh, uh, they saw the opportunity and they, they started to implement, uh, if not exactly a version of the German feed-in law. And, and that increased uh, the, uh, the demand for photovoltaics. Uh, something else happened that they started making these cells, and, and I've not captured all of them here in this picture, but some cells that actually look like marble. So that uh, if you uh, are thinking about building marble facade for a building, you may put the photovoltaic panel, which will actually cost you less than the marble that you would have put. Okay. So, so that increased the demand for photovoltaics. For the past three, four years, uh, the photovoltaics companies cannot keep up with the demand. So <clears throat> the market continued to explode. So <clears throat> the rate of growth, tremendous. Photovoltaic costs in the 70s, $100 a watt, 80s went down to $30 a watt, 2003, $3 a watt. 2010, we fully expect it to be at 120 a watt, and 2012, $1 a watt. And this is all uh, validated uh, data. However, keep in mind that this is only panel cost, balance of the system adds another 2 to $3 a watt, so that even in 2012, the cost of power from photovoltaic will still be more expensive than solar thermal power. So with this in the background, you have to think, okay, everything is happening in the right direction. Things are going well. Countries are changing policies. What more can be done? And where are the challenges and the opportunities? Now, here are the challenges. We are reaching the limits of cost reduction as far as PV cells are concerned 
based on the current concepts. Solar thermal power costs have been stagnant or have actually increased since 1990. Energy storage is missing from all of the cost calculations of whether it's photovoltaics or solar thermal power. And finally, research on other applications of solar, solar cooling, desalination, other applications like uh, uh, environmental applications is almost non-existent. So this is just so you look at the cost that if we were to go down to the cost of solar coal power, photovoltaics will have to come down to 25% of the present cost. Solar thermal will have to come down to half of the present cost. So that's where the challenges and opportunities are, that uh, we will need new concepts in photovoltaic conversion that bypass the present concept of band gap, band gap limitation. Okay? Totally new way, fundamentally new way of thinking in photovoltaics because otherwise we cannot reduce the cost anymore. Same thing in solar thermal power. You can reduce the cost of solar thermal power maybe by 20 to 25 percent by mass production and by increase in uh, uh, improvement in efficiencies and so on. But to decrease it by 50 percent, you need to look at fundamentally new concepts. Now, I know that there are some researchers and faculty members in the audience. These are the opportunities that I'm mentioning for them. And research and cost-effective integration of energy storage in PV as well as solar thermal power. In addition, research in other applications, for example, solar desalination, solar cooling, photocatalytic oxidation for environmental applications, and so on. And I'll just give you two examples and then end my uh, uh, talk of uh, new and emerging developments based on what I've just said, you know, uh, doing what I preach, that is looking at totally new concepts. One is that we need to look at fundamentally new way of thermodynamic power cycles. And, and this is where one area where we're working on where there's 50% potential reduction in the cost of power. Another is antennae-based solar electric power where overall 80% efficiency potential. So I'm not going to go through this. I know in the audience not everybody's technical, but just wanted to let you know that we are working on a new thermodynamic cycle that hopefully will reduce the cost of solar thermal power where we can achieve grid parity. Nanoscale antennae I'll spend just a couple of minutes on it because it's a totally new concept. That the background is that conventional PV is limited by band gap and relies on the quantum nature of light. A new concept which is based on wave nature of light was proposed in actually 1968, but it was not possible at that time because we did not have the technologies that were needed. Antenna is usually used for radio uh, frequency emission and reception, and because the, uh, the wavelength of uh, radio waves is a few meters, your antenna size is a few meters. Wavelength of solar light is fraction of a micron, so your antenna size has to be fraction of a micron. So now with the, uh, uh, the nanotechnologies and biotechnologies that are already available, the concept actually is becoming uh, practical. So this just shows uh, what I've told you, that uh, the wavelength of uh, uh, radio waves is a few meters, and wavelength of uh, UV and visible light is a fraction of a micron. And there are many possibilities in it. This just shows uh, uh, an array of carbon nanotubes. This shows a close-up of that. This shows biologically-based antennas that we could use, and uh, this shows an array of those antennas and this shows that when it's actually built, you'll be selling photovoltaics at cents per yard rather than uh, dollar per watt. So, but there are lots of technical challenges here. These are some of them. And uh, with that, I will conclude 
that uh, it's clear that renewable energy will provide as much as 50% of the global energy needs by 2050. However, in order to get there, R&D will need to be accelerated and energy policies in the world, in every country, will have to be changed and will have to be changed sooner than later. Annual growth rates that you will see in the future will be far greater than the 30% we are seeing today. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Goswani. We will move ahead to the next speaker, Professor Avram Kribus. Avi Kribus is a professor of mechanical engineering at the School of Mechanical Engineering at the Faculty of Engineering at Tel Aviv University. In addition, Avi is a chairman of the Israel Sustainable Energy Society and a close collaborator of the Porter School of Environmental Studies. Can we change the presentation? Where is it? Good luck. So before I start to tell you about uh, the renewable energy innovation in Israel, I would like to start with some philosophy. What really do we expect from our energy supply? The first uh, expectation or the first requirement is, of course, that energy should be affordable. We know that uh, fossil energy has been affordable, at least until the last year. But is renewable energy affordable? Well, it's on the way there, but not quite. Renewable energy today is not affordable enough. But is this the only requirement? Is this the only thing that we expect from energy supply? A very important property that we expect is to provide many different forms of energy. For example, heating, lighting, electricity, um, fuel for our vehicles, or even energy for the industries that produce the stuff that we use every day. So we know, for example, that oil can provide all of these. But can renewable energy provide all of these needs, different needs of energy? This is something we have to show. Something very important. We are used to and we expect to have energy on demand whenever we want, wherever we want. Uh, oil, again, can do it. Coal can do it. Can renewable energy do it? This is a major problem. Solar energy, wind energy, they are not available whenever we need them. So this is a problem that we have to solve. <laughs> okay, and the fourth requirement, and this is something that came up only recently, we would like our energy to be friendly to the environment and friendly to society. This is probably the only requirement where renewable energy has an advantage relative to fossil fuel, so at least something. So when I review the different uh, research projects, the different ideas in renewable energy, we have to keep in mind, are these really helpful? Is this research project doing something in order to address all of these four issues that, that we have to address? So let's start with the question of cost, the question of affordability of renewable energy. Obviously, there are two ways to go about it. One is to go to higher conversion efficiency, and the second is to use materials and manufacturing processes that are less expensive. So let's start with something that is kind of wildly exotic. How can we reduce the cost of photovoltaic cells? We can use materials that are not semiconductors, not silicon, not gallium arsenide like the normal cells. 
we can use proteins taken from nature. And photosynthetic proteins have, have been known for billions of years to convert sunlight, so why not use this? So the research group of uh, Hanoch Karmeli at Tel Aviv University and his collaborators have been working in this direction. This is actually not a new idea. We have known for a long time about the capabilities of photosynthesis, but they have done some uh, advances, significant advances in this direction. Why is this good? Because the proteins produced uh, for us by nature are much, much less expensive than semiconductors. So this is a possibility of a breakthrough in the cost of photovoltaic cells. So this is a picture of the wonderful protein molecule that does the job. This molecule is able to absorb sunlight and to use the energy of the sunlight in order to free an electron, a carrier of electrical charge, and to bring it to a specific location on the uh, molecule. And this is actually the work that we do in uh, normal photovoltaic cells, but this is done by nature. But this is only the beginning of the story, because what we need to do is to see how we can extract this electric charge from the molecule. So what this research group has developed is a clever way to genetically engineer the molecule in a way that it can have a, a certain location that easily bonds to metal. So when we place these molecules close to a metal plate, it will bond uh, autonomously without us having to go and place every molecule in place. This is quite difficult on the nanometer scale. This also has the advantage that all molecules are placed in exactly the same direction, the same orientation, so the electric charge is accumulated. If they were each one in, in a different orientation, then of course the electric current would cancel each other. So these are very important advances, and this is uh, possibly a breakthrough in the possibility to use photovoltaic cells made from photosynthetic proteins. Of course, there are many more issues on, uh, that were uh, treated, and some of them were solved by this uh, research. One is to maintain these proteins active and stable in a dry environment, because we would like our solar cells not to be in a water environment. Also, how to place a top electrode on these molecules, how to make many layers of these molecules in order to increase the absorption of sunlight. The potential for this technology is to have an overall efficiency of more than 20%. This is about the same as the best silicon solar cells today. This is still far in the future, of course. This is still basic research at the beginning steps, but uh, if we see that the potential is for very low cost and performance equivalent to what we have today, then this is a very promising direction. So this is one approach to low cost solar electricity. Let's go to another direction. And this time, this is technology that is actually available and ready, much less exotic than the previous one. Uh, these research groups and the company 3G Solar are working on dye-sensitized cells this is actually a well-known idea for several decades, but they are working not on some new uh, breakthrough idea, but on careful engineering optimization and careful cost reduction of this technology so that the solar panels and solar cells that they produce have really the lowest possible cost. The performance of this technology is not very impressive, but combined with very low cost, the cost per unit electricity can be very low. So this technology probably will not be uh, a revolution for Europe or even for Israel, but in many developing countries where, that cannot afford the high cost, high efficiency solar cells, this can be a real breakthrough and a real opportunity to have solar energy at a reasonable, affordable cost. So this is about low cost. Now what about high efficiency? How can we uh, have efficiency that is significantly higher than the normal conversion devices that we use today. So again, I'm happy that Professor Goswami mentioned this uh, approach of uh, conversion with antennae. It saves me some explanation. We have a group here at Tel Aviv University uh, working on research in this direction. And the conversion efficiency potentially can be up to 70 or 80 percent. And just to mention, the best photovoltaic cell that has ever been produced is about 40 percent. So if this becomes a reality, then we will have a major breakthrough in conversion efficiency. 
And as Professor Goswami mentioned, this requires very small electrical devices, very fast electrical devices because of the nature of sunlight. So one way to do it is to use carbon nanotubes, which are approximately the right size. And this is an example of an electrical circuit produced with carbon nanotubes in the laboratory of Dr. Hanin at Tel Aviv University. And just to give you an idea of the scale, this diagonal line is a carbon nanotube. And the red bar at the bottom is actually uh, uh, 20 times smaller than the thickness of a human hair. And the thickness of the carbon nanotubes is 100 times smaller than this red bar. So this gives you an idea that how we are working at the, really the extreme range of, of engineering that can be done. So this is, again, still far in the future, many problems to be solved on the way, but the potential is tremendous. What can we do today for high efficiency? The efficiency of normal solar panels is about 15 to 20 percent, but using concentration, we can actually get much higher efficiency. So the research group of Professor Jeff Gordon and uh, his collaborators at Ben Gurion University have developed sophisticated optics to concentrate the solar radiation. Uh, for example, we see on the left that uh, the concentrator collects radiation from a large area and channels all the radiation to a tiny cell at the bottom of the picture. And using this kind of device, it is possible, first of all, to reduce the amount of expensive semiconductor material that we use in the device, but we can also use these advanced cells that have 40% efficiency, and the overall collector efficiency would be about 30%. So this is 50 to 100% to more uh, than the common solar panels that we have today. So this is a major advance in uh, efficiency, and this can be implemented today. And actually, the American company Sol Focus has uh, entered this technology, and they are working with Ben Gurion University and building such systems. And I assume that these systems will be avail available commercially pretty soon. Systems with 30% conversion efficiency. Can we go to even higher efficiency? This is very difficult with the straightforward uh, photovoltaic uh, technology, but we can do another trick here. We realize that from the solar energy that is intercepted by our collector, 30% becomes electricity, but the other 70% becomes heat and is actually wasted. So why waste it? We can collect this heat and use it as a second energy product, which is also valuable. In this way, we can use in one way or another uh, up to 80% of the solar radiation. We have to be careful here from scientific and, and economic point of view. The value of heat and the value of electricity is not the same. But in the terms of how much of the solar radiation we are actually using, we can reach significantly higher efficiency. So we are working on this here at Tel Aviv University, and actually there are three companies who are pursuing this direction. One way is to use relatively simple and inexpensive technology. Just take something that looks like a normal solar panel and put behind the solar cells a heat exchanger, something that carries water, for example, and the heat is transferred to the water. This is done by the company called Millennium Electric. Advantage is simplicity and low cost. Disadvantage is that the temperature that we can reach is relatively low, maybe 50, 50 degrees centigrade. This is good for domestic water heating, but not for much more. We can use the same idea with a concentrating collector, and in this case, we can go to higher temperature. And higher temperature means that we can provide heat to industry. We can do air conditioning. We can do desalination. There are many applications for the heat, and of course, this becomes much more valuable. And we were talking about cost and efficiency, but actually, when we look at it this way, we are also addressing the criteria of, criterion of diversity. We are now producing different types of energy. All of them are useful. All of them fulfill a, a need that, that is uh, very important. So this is, for example, the collector that is developed by the company DISP, Distributed Solar Power. The idea is to make small collectors of a size of maybe one or one and a half meters so that these collectors uh, can be installed on rooftops close to the uh, consumer that consumes the electricity and the thermal energy. And uh, only yesterday it was announced that this company will install a pilot plant at the offices of Intel Israel in Haifa. 
This system will produce about 30 kilowatts of electricity and about 30 kilowatts of air conditioning uh, simultaneously, side by side, for use inside the building. And from the conceptual drawing here on the left, we can see the advantage of these small collectors is that we can arrange them in any way that we like without worrying about constraints of the architecture, about other uses of the roof. We can always work around these constraints and find a place to put these collectors. This is very difficult to do if our collectors were, were much larger. So this plant will probably be ready somewhere near the uh, beginning of 2009 or some, sometime during 2009. Uh, the third company that is approaching uh, this is uh, Zenit Solar, which is going for larger uh, collectors, I think about seven meters high, not suitable for installation on buildings, but suitable for installation in solar farms in open areas, and they are also planning soon a demonstration system. So it seems that Israel is sort of becoming a powerhouse in concentrating photovoltaics. Again, let me quote Professor Goswami. A long time ago, we were leaders in solar energy. It's about time that we reclaim our position, at least in some fields of solar energy. Um, we talked about diversity. Let's talk a about a completely different form of renewable energy, and that is energy saving. I call this also renewable energy because it displaces or reduces the use of fossil fuels, and it is renewable. We can save energy again and again every day in the same method. So one type of energy saving is a reduction in the fuel consumption of vehicles. We all know that most passenger cars are built in an aerodynamic or streamlined shape in order to reduce the air resistance and reduce the fuel consumption. But if we have a large heavy vehicle like a truck, this is not possible. The shape is box-like, and this creates an enormous wind resistance and increases the fuel consumption. The aerodynamics group of Tel Aviv University, led by Professor Seifert, has developed a solution for this problem that does not require us to change the shape of the truck. This is a model truck in a wind tunnel test. And here on the sides of the truck, uh, are installed very small devices that suck and blow air through very small holes in the side. And it turns out that these very small uh, devices and very small action is enough to change the pattern of airflow around the truck and create a significant effect. So we see here the drag force on the model of the truck as a function of the intensity of the ac activity of these devices. And we see that as we activate them more and more, the drag force is reduced. Potentially, we can reduce the drag force, the aerodynamic resistance, by 20%, and this means 10% fuel saving. And this is a very important number if you look at the, how much fuel is consumed by heavy vehicles around the world. A similar idea can also be used to increase the performance of wind turbines. We know that wind turbines have a limited range of operation. If the wind speed is too high or too low, then we cannot extract uh, energy at full capacity. So a very similar idea to insert these small devices that suck and blow air into the blade of the turbine, this modifies the flow around the turbine. And for example, it has a significant effect in the regime of low wind speed. So we see here the uh, lift coefficient, which is an indication of how well the wind turbine is able to extract energy from the wind. So as we go to lower speed, here we go to lower speed, then the basic wind turbine profile becomes worse and worse and is not able to extract energy from the wind. But if we take the modified uh, blade with the improvement and with these tiny devices, we see that there is no loss in the capability to produce energy. Actually, there's even a small increase. So this means that the same turbine can collect much more energy even on days when the wind speed is not high enough. It could also mean that some sites that today are not considered cost effective because there are many days where the wind speed is too low, tomorrow they could become cost effective and we could have much higher resource in terms of uh, wind energy. Let's talk about the, uh, the other approach, the, the other criterion. We would like to have energy on demand, and that means that renewable energy like solar and wind has to be stored in some way. It is an intermittent resource. We can collect it only when nature permits us to collect it, and we need some way to store it. 
There's a lot of work done in Israel on batteries, advanced batteries, and uh, different storage schemes with reversible fuel cells. But what I would like to concentrate today is on the production of renewable fuels, because a fuel, either gas or liquid, is something that we can store. So this is another way to overcome the problem of intermittency of renewable energy. A major problem in this question of renewable fuels is the question of conflict between the biomass, which is the normal source for uh, renewable fuels, and the food production. And, um, for example, if the United States government says that one-third of the corn produced in the U.S. has to go to ethanol production, then, of course, it would have an effect on, on uh, corn prices. And, of course, some poor people in uh, Mexico or other places would have trouble getting the corn that they need to eat. So what we need to do, the real challenge is to find a way around it, to, to produce those renewable fuels in a way that does not compete in any way with food production, that does not compete on resources that are needed for food production. So here are some interesting ways to do it. So one way was, is proposed by Professor Amram Eshel and his colleagues from Tel Aviv University, and this way is to find plants uh, or create plants that can grow in the desert and can grow without the use of potable water, to grow with saline water, brackish water, that cannot be used for anything else. And of course, they have to grow fast enough, so this whole thing is practical. In this case, if we find this kind of plant, then uh, there is no competition for land resources or for water resources that are needed for food production. So here is an example of an experiment that this group did. First picture is the before picture, just to convince you that this is really a desert. One year later, this is what it looks like. And this is in the desert soil and using water that is unusable for anything else. So this is a plant that grows very fast, has high productivity, and does not compete for resources with anything. So this is a socially responsible production of biomass. The same group is now pursuing an additional direction, an additional desert plant, again, that can grow in the desert without any social conflict. And from this plant, it is possible to produce biodiesel. It has a high oil content, and this oil is a basis for production of biodiesel. Another group at the Volcani Center for Agricultural Research is working on a different kind of plant. This is called castor beans. This is actually a family of, of many different types of, of uh, plants. And this family is well known for having a very high content of oil that can be used for production of biodiesel. Uh, there are also other plants like uh, jatropha and palm oil and so on. The main advantage of this family, the castor beans, is that it is possible to adapt some, some types of these castor beans to be grown on marginal soil. Again, soil that cannot be used for other agricultural production. So again, using the correct type of this plant and also modifying it a little bit with uh, genetic engineering, they claim that it is possible to generate a, an energy crop, something that we can use to produce biodiesel, without, again, without competition against the resources needed for food production. Another approach to the same problem is to use as source material for the fuel production not complete plants, but to use only waste. After we have extracted the food or extracted any other useful material from the plant, actually we still have a lot of organic material from the plant, and we can use this one as, as a source for the uh, renewable fuel. Um, however, this is not so easy. In order to do that, there is a well-known process called gasification, but this takes place at a relatively high temperature, 800 degrees or even higher, and this is very difficult. This uh, requires specialized technology. Can we do it at a much lower temperature? So this is one way to do it. We would like to convert this kind of waste material into a useful biofuel uh, at low temperature, and the process that we propose is called supercritical water gasification. We can do it at 400 degrees, and supercritical means that we do it at high pressure. The high pressure 
intuitively we can say that it sort of compensates for the need for high temperature and the reaction of conversion from the biomass into the fuel that we want can take place at much lower temperature. The products are a gas that is rich in hydrogen and also has some methane. Both of these are very good fuels. And in principle, we can also take this mix of gases and convert them to methanol, which is a liquid fuel. And this could be a direct substitute for the fuels that we use, for example, in transportation. So this is what the process looks like. I will not go into details. You can just note that we have here the organic waste coming into the uh, cycle renewable fuel coming out, and we have some options here. For example, in order to do the process, we need to uh, heat, to provide heat in a chemical reactor. Most people who have studied this process say, okay, we burn natural gas to provide this heat. But we say, why not use solar energy? In the case that we use solar energy, then our fuel is 100% renewable. It does not have any contribution from fossil fuel, so this looks more interesting. Another aspect is that we can separate the carbon dioxide that is also created in this process. And if we have a separate stream of carbon dioxide, CO2, we can actually sequestrate it, not release it back to the atmosphere. So we actually get a double benefit. This process can have a negative net contribution of atmospheric carbon. If we just burn the biomass, then we get a neutral effect. That is, we avoid burning uh, coal or oil and, and pushing additional CO2, and we are neutral. But if we use this uh, renewable carbon and sequestrate the CO2, then actually we have a negative or double the benefit relative to normal use of biomass. Other options. There are many options studied uh, on how to produce renewable fuels. So just one example of a process that is developed at the Weizmann Institute. This is a reactor for doing this kind of conversion. Here is sunlight coming into the reactor. And here the idea is to use a molten salt as an additional or support material. It actually improves the transfer of heat into the biomass, it improves the transfer of mass, and also serves as a catalyst to accelerate the reaction and improve the conversion of the biomass into a hydrogen. And this can be done, for example, using a solar tower. Uh, as we see here, this is the solar tower at the Weizmann Institute. So to summarize, Israel is only a very small, a tiny dot on the map of the Earth that we are trying to preserve by using solar uh, renewable energy. Israel, for a long time, has been a leader in solar energy and also is a leader in areas in life sciences and agricultural sciences, which are the basis for biomass and biofuel production. So naturally, I've concentrated on these areas in my presentation. But uh, of course, there are many different things being developed in Israel, and if anybody in the audience is angry why I didn't mention his project, then of course, there is no time to tell about everything. Uh, Clearly, in Israel, we do not have the physical resources that are available in, in countries like United States or Spain or Australia or Germany who are uh, leaders in renewable energy, but we do have other resources, resources of motivation, of innovation, of brain power that, that we would like to use and to continue to use in order to continue our contribution to renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Krivus. Uh, we are on schedule and we will move ahead to the next speaker, Professor Aldo Steinfeld. Uh, professor Steinfeld is a full professor at the Department of Mechanical and Process Engineering of ETH Zurich. He is the head of Solar Technology Laboratory of the Paul Scherer Institute. The title of the talk is going to be Solar Hydrogen present and future. I assume it's online, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, my talk will focus on the technological aspects of uh, solar hydrogen production 
uh, specifically solar thermochemical production. And this scheme uh, shows several routes for the thermochemical conversion of concentrated solar energy into solar hydrogen. Uh, all of these routes uh, are high temperature, highly endothermic reactions, energy intensive reactions that make use of concentrated solar radiation as the energy source of process heat. The chemical source of hydrogen is water. And some of the processes uh, shown here also make use of fossil fuels as the uh, chemical source of hydrogen. And therefore, I have also added a, an optional CO2 carbon sequestration if we wish to end up with a 100% solar fuel. Now, the two processes in the right side that make use only of water as the chemical source of hydrogen are the solar thermolysis and the solar thermochemical cycle. They are classified as the water splitting processes. And those on the right, the solar reforming and the solar gasification, they are classified as the decarbonization processes. Decarbonization implies we are removing the carbon from the fossil fuel prior to their use for power generation. And here in the middle, we have the solar electricity plus electrolysis. This is our benchmark. Uh, whatever we do will have to be more efficient and cost effective as a solar electricity plus electrolysis. This is already commercial, uh, such as this uh, power plant. This is an 11 megawatt electric, 55 megawatt thermal solar power plant, which went into operation in Spain last year. You see here the field of heliostat, the tower, and on top of the tower, this is driving a ranking, a ranking cycle with a peak solar to electricity efficiency of 21%. This efficiency will have to multiply by the efficiency of electricity to hydrogen to get the final solar to hydrogen efficiency. Now, the solar chemical technologies are not as mature as the solar electricity generation technologies, but they will, they will make use of the same infrastructure, the field of heliostat, the tower. On top of the tower, we remove the boiler and we place our chemical reactor. Now, let me describe this, uh, these thermochemical routes for hydrogen production, and let's get started from the right side. Solar thermolysis, this is the direct water splitting, and it's not as simple as it appears. The thermal dissociation of water into hydrogen and oxygen uh, requires extremely high temperatures, as it can be seen in this uh, plot, the delta G going to zero at temperatures above 4,000 Kelvin. Now, further complications arise from the fact that the water dissociates into hydrogen and oxygen, but also into other species. We can see that in this equilibrium uh, mole fraction diagram. For example, at 3000 K, we have about 30% dissociation into hydrogen, oxygen, but also other species, monoatomic oxygen, monoatomic hydrogen, OH, all these are undesired uh, products. However, the most difficult part in the direct water splitting is the need to separate hydrogen and oxygen at high temperatures in order to avoid ending up with an explosive mixture. Now, it is possible to bypass the separation problem, and that will be by making use of thermochemical cycles. For example, this two-step cycle based on metal oxide redox reaction. In the first step, a metal oxide, which is being described by MX or Y, is being thermally dissociated into its elements, the metal, and oxygen is released. And in the second step, the metal is reacted with water in an hydrolyzer to generate hydrogen and the metal oxide, which is recycled to the first step. So the net reaction is water to give hydrogen and oxygen, but these two gases have been produced in different steps, eliminating the need for high temperature gas separation. Now, it is important to estimate what would be the maximum possible efficiency for converting solar energy into the chemical energy of hydrogen. 
And this estimation we can do, but before I, I explain that, let me, let me show you an example of a metal oxide that, uh, that will be proper for this cycle. We can use zinc oxide in the solar reactor to thermally reduce into zinc and oxygen. The enthalpy change is 557 kilojoules per mole. This is very good, highly endothermic. We can store a lot of energy in a small amount of material. And we require temperatures above 2,000 Kelvin. In the second step, zinc reacts with water to generate hydrogen and the original zinc oxide. The reaction is exothermic. It doesn't require a source, a source of energy. Now, the maximum efficiency for this cycle can be estimated using this type of diagram where we have a solar reactor to generate zinc. We have a quenching device to cool down the products to ambient temperature. We have the hydrolyzer to react zinc with water to produce hydrogen. And finally, a fuel cell to extract the maximum amount of work out of the hydrogen as it recombines to give water. The maximum efficiency would be the work output of the fuel cell divided by the solar power input. For this cycle, is 35% if we, leave, if we let this energy being rejected to the environment. If we recover this energy, we can go up to 58%. So the efficiency is high, there is a high potential, and the thermal efficiency is directly uh, related with the economics. The more efficient the process is, the smaller would be the solar collector area for producing a given amount of a product. Now let me show you, coming back to this diagram, the challenge is how to design a solar reactor that operates at 2000 K to produce zinc, metallic zinc with solar energy. This is a schematic of the solar reactor that is being developed for the thermal dissociation of zinc oxide. Zinc oxide is the reactant. Zinc and oxygen are the products operating at 2000 K. And while I'll explain you how it works, let me see if I can activate uh, this video clip showing the reactor being tested at the solar furnace of the Paul Scher Institute in Switzerland. Now the reactor is a rotating cavity lined with the zinc oxide particles that are being held by centrifugal force. With this arrangement, the zinc, zinc oxide particles are directly exposed to high flux concentrated solar radiation and serve the functions of radiant absorbers and chemical reactants. This is a plot showing the zinc oxide temperature in Kelvin as a function of time. As soon as the shutter of the solar furnace is being opened, the temperature jumps from ambient to over 2,000 degree Kelvin and the reaction starts immediately. This is the result of the direct solar irradiation of the reactants, providing a very efficient means of heat transfer directly to the reaction site where the energy is needed. This prototype that you see in the, in the, here in the video clip is a 10 kilowatt reactor operating at a nominal temperature of 2,000 K, concentration of more than 5,000 suns at the entrance, 5,000 kilowatt per square meter of solar radiation entering the cavity. Here you see the mass flow rate of the reactants and a zinc yield, the best result, reaching 90%. Now it is possible to reduce the temperature requirement and this is by introducing a reducing agent, for example carbon from coke or even better if we can have the carbon from biomass so that we have a CO2 neutral a reducing agent. Now the reaction reads zinc oxide plus carbon to give zinc and CO, and this plot here on the right side is showing the minimum temperature required to produce zinc as a function of the stoichiometric ratio lambda. When lambda equals zero, we are talking pure thermal dissociation on carbon. We need temperatures of the order of 2000, I already mentioned, if we are using a stoichiometric mixture with lambda equal one, that would be one mole of carbon per mole of zinc oxide, we can go down with the temperature by 1,000 degrees. This makes the technology more technically feasible. Now the zinc, as before, can be shifted to hydrogen, and the CO can also be shifted to hydrogen. Now this type of, re of reaction has been uh, investigated in the framework of a European Union project called Zolzinc, 
with the participation of the institutions that you see here, the Weizmann Institute as well. And this is the schematic of the solar reactor, which is a cavity containing a packed bed of zinc oxide and carbon that shrinks as the reaction progresses. This reactor is supposed to be a batch reactor, one batch per day. So you will feed the reactor uh, at night, you will operate the whole day, the packed bed shrinks, and at the end of the day, you can refill again. Now, a, a 300 kilowatt prototype has been uh, fabricated. Here you see the dimensions, diameter 1.4 meters. Here you see a photograph of this reactor, which was tested at the solar tower of the Weizmann Institute. The reactor was located in this house over here, below the tower. This tower is about 60 meters high. We have the field of heliostat, concentrated the solar radiation on top of the tower. Here on the top, we place an hyperbolic reflector to obtain what we call a beam down solar irradiation, radiation coming from the top of the reactor. Let me show you representative uh, results, 300 kilowatt solar power input, 1,500 suns concentration, the reactor operating at a, a nominal temperature of 1,500 K, at a production rate of 45 kilograms per hour, zinc purity 95%, zinc coming out in the form of a vapor, which is condensed. And finally, a very important indicator of the performance of the reactor, this is the thermal efficiency, defined as the enthalpy change of the reactor divided by the solar power input. In other words, how much of the solar energy entering the reactor has been converted into the chemical energy of the zinc coming out of the reactor, 30%. Now, let me go into the second step of the cycle. You remember, first step, production of zinc. Second step, zinc reacting with water to produce hydrogen. And the reactor concept is an aerosol flow with three regions. First, we mix water and zinc, water vapor and zinc vapor to produce nanoparticles that react in situ to generate hydrogen. The nanoparticles, they provide a very high specific surface area, enhancing the kinetics. And the reactor is shown here in this schematic, basically a vertical tube where the zinc is evaporated. It is being mixed with a stoichiometric mixture of steam to generate the nanoparticles and react to produce hydrogen and zinc oxide. Now, let me show you the results showing the, the zinc evaporation rate versus the hydrogen production rate with a yield of 90%. This is a flow reactor, continuous mode. Reaction time is just a, a, a few seconds because of the high kinetics for the nanoparticle uh, formation. Let me now go to the processes here on the uh, right side, and I'll start with the solar reforming. In the solar reforming, we are uh, reacting a, a gaseous hydrocarbon, for example, natural gas, with steam into a solar reactor to produce a zinc gas mixture, primarily CO and hydrogen, which can be further processed to hydrogen for its use in a fuel cell to generate electricity. Now, this, from the zinc gas to hydrogen, this is conventional technology. The challenge is how to produce this zinc gas from these ingredi ingredients in a solar reactor. This is the schematic of, of the reactor concept used for the solar reforming, which is being developed also in the framework of a European Union project, SOLREF. Here you see the partners of this project, DLR in Germany, the Weizmann Institute here in Israel, ETH and PSI as well partners. And the main component of this reactor I'm showing here is a hemispherical absorber. Here you see a photograph. This absorber is porous. It's called RPC, reticul reticulate porous ceramic. This absorber is made of silicon carbide coated with the rhodium, which is the catalyst for this reaction, and directly exposed to the high flux radiation. We have methane and steam passing through this high temperature ceramic porous absorber and reacting to give zinc gas. 
Uh, it is important to, to understand this interaction of radiation with the RPC. For doing that, we perform a computer tomography to get the, the exact 3D representation of this complex material. And once we have this uh, geometrical representation, we can uh, calculate different uh, the, the morphology of this uh, material, for example, the porosity, the specific surface area. But we can, we can also uh, calculate the transport properties for heat and fluid flow, for example, the extinction coefficient and the scattering phase function. These are properties of material that let us understand how radiation penetrates into the structure and heat is being transferred into the reactants. Finally, let me cover the solar gasification. In the solar gasification, the reactants are solid carbonaceous materials, for example, coal, but it can be any carbonaceous materials, can be also waste materials containing a significant amount of carbon, can be also biomass, in that case, we will be talking about the CO2 neutral uh, carbonaceous material. Can be, for example, pet coke, which is a byproduct uh, from the refining of oil. And these carbonaceous materials are being mixed with water. They enter a solar gasification reactor, again, to produce a syngas mixture, this mixture of CO and hydrogen. Now, in this, by the way, the solar gasification, as I mentioned before, is a high temperature reaction, highly endothermic, and we are using concentrated solar radiation again as the source of process heat. Now, in this schematic, I'm showing all the things that you can do with this syn gas. You can use it as a fuel in a combined cycle to generate electricity. Combined cycle, that will be the Brighton and Rankin cycle in series, giving very high efficiency of electricity generation, or like in the previous case of the reforming, you can shift the syn gas all the way to hydrogen and use in the fuel cell. Now, when you do combustion of the syn gas, you have CO2 being released. When you process to hydrogen, again, you have CO2 being released. I'm showing here, optional, you can take this CO2 and do sequestration. Let's assume for a moment that this CO2 is released to the atmosphere. And let's find out how much of this CO2 is released. In, if, we are, if we decide to go this way, coal gasification to syn gas and using a combined cycle for electricity generation, we will be releasing around 500 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour electricity. If we decide to go from coal gasified to syn gas and then all the way to hydrogen generation in a fuel cell, we'll be releasing somewhat more than that, about 580 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour electricity. That would be because the processing of the syn gas to hydrogen, you, we need to invest some energy, not so much in the shift reactor, but in the separation, there is an investment of energy which brings the efficiency down, increases the CO2 uh, emissions. For comparison, the conventional way of extracting power from coal, that would be by using coal as a combustion fuel in a 35% ranking cycle, such as the power plant that you have in Hedera here, releasing about one kilogram CO2 per kilowatt hour electricity. So these graphs gives us an indication what we are gaining by mixing solar energy and fossil fuels. We can cut emissions by half. Basically, the calorific value of the syn gas product is 50% due to solar energy, 50% coming from coal, and that will be without introducing a sequestration step. Now, let me show you the technology for the gasification. This is a reactor that is being developed in a joint project ETH, CMAT from Spain, 
and PDVSA. This is the oil company funding the project. And uh, the carbonaceous material that we are gasifying is pet coke. Pet coke is short for petroleum coke. This is a byproduct from the refinery of heavy crude oil. Basically, it's a waste product. You can take pet coke and mix it with water to produce a liquid slurry that is injected tangentially inside this cylindrical cavity to create a vortex flow which progresses towards the rear part of the reactor following this helical path. This two-phase flow, steam and pet coke particles, is directly exposed to concentrated solar radiation, again, providing very efficient means of heat transfer directly into the reaction site where the energy is needed. Now, let me show you the representative results of, this, uh, of testing this reactor in the solar furnace. Five kilowatt power input prototype. The dimensions are not indicated, but the diameter of the opening, we call it the aperture, is six centimeters. So through six centimeters, we are putting in five kilowatt with a concentration of 3,000 suns. Here you see the mass flow rate of the pet coke, temperatures of the order of 1,600 Kelvin, 87% conversion of the slurry all the way to sink gas. Now the slurry is being injected at ambient temperature. The sink gas is coming out at 1,600 Kelvin. Residence time is five seconds to get the 87%. And the thermal efficiency is defined the same way that we have defined it before, enthalpy change divided by the solar power input, 19%. That means 19% of the five kilowatt has been converted, has been stored as energy in the sink gas uh, product. Here you see the quality of the sink gas. If we operate the reactor at 1500 Kelvin, we can produce a mixture of 50% hydrogen, 50% carbon monoxide. This is what is called high quality in gas because every mole of CO can be further shifted to give more hydrogen. Now for comparison, the conventional gasification in which you need to burn a portion of the feedstock to provide energy into the reaction produces a much lower quality in gas because you are doing a combustion. You burn the pet coke or the coal to produce CO2 and other contaminants which create a much lower quality of the sink gas. But this is not the only disadvantage of the conventional uh, gasification. You need to do this combustion with pure oxygen. You cannot do combustion in air, otherwise you will contaminate with nitrogen. Therefore, a conventional gasification plant will need to have what is called the air separation unit before the reactor where you produce the pure stream of oxygen. This is a highly energy intensive process. In the case of the solar gasification, you see the reactants are simply pet coke and water, no need for oxygen. There is no combustion taking place. The solar energy is providing the energy for the reaction. This reactor now is being scaled up from five kilowatt to half a megawatt, 500 kilowatt, a factor of 100 in power. Here you see the schematic of the, we call it the big reactor, which is going to be uh, located on the top of a solar tower. This is the solar facility in Almeria, Spain. This facility is, uh, delivers seven megawatt, but we only need half a megawatt, so we will be using only a few of the heliostats here to concentrate solar energy on the tower where we place the reactor. I'm coming to, to the end of my talk, and I'll come back to, to the, the, the first slide that I've been showing with the different processes. Uh, the ones, if you recall, the two on the left side, this is what we call the water splitting processes that required high temperatures, but this is the ultimate goal because these processes, they only make use of water as the chemical source of hydrogen so that we have a closed material cycle. 
this is these processes are the long term goal and it will take it, it will take time until the, the the technology is developed for commercial implementation now the two processes on the uh, right side these are the decarbonization processes we have seen that the temperatures are much more moderate. We can use a combination of conventional fossil, fossil fuel technology and the novel solar technology. These are the processes that we call it the short midterm transition to solar hydrogen. With this, I conclude my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. The last speaker of this session is Mr. Stephen Chok. Uh, Mr. Chok is, from the is a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Renewable Energy, Office of Energy, Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy, USA. The title of the lecture is Renewable Energy in the USA. Please. Thank you very much. Again, I want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Mazer Yaran for giving me the privilege to speak to you today. I want to talk to you about the U.S. perspective on renewable energy, why we're doing it, what we see are, are the major barriers. But before I do that, uh, I want to emphasize something that Professor Krebus mentioned that uh, before you even do renewable energy, you've got to be thinking energy efficiency. Energy efficiency gives you the quickest payback. And I'm not talking about uh, conservation, which is doing less or having less with less, but I'm talking about more work for the same amount of, of uh, energy input. So doing more, with doing more with less energy input, not doing less. So that's really critical, and especially for the built environment. So I'll talk to some of the barriers for renewable energy we found very uh, good mechanisms for affording energy efficiency, that first cost, something called energy savings performance contracts. And I urge uh, the university and other folks around here that are concerned about efficiency for the built environment to look into that mechanism where the customer puts no money up front at all. The customer uh, energy service company provides all the upfront capital and it gets paid over the life of the savings. And then the customer owns that equipment whether it's HVAC equipment, heating, ventilation, air conditioning equipment, or whatever it is. So there are mechanisms like that that recognize the life cycle benefits of energy efficiency, and they carry over, of course, to renewable energy. I want to talk about that because renewable energy is in, in, the, same, in the same boat, so to speak. And for the students out there, the, the, the barriers to renewable energy really fall into three buckets, if you will. It, it's access to technology which there's a lot of future technology you heard about here with hydrogen and thermochemical cycles and things like that. But for the most part, to do something now, the technology is available now, not a huge barrier. Access to capital, which is uh, not so much a huge barrier, but it is for some technology coming out of the R&D pipeline or maybe still be upstream of the R&D pipeline. But the big barrier in renewable energy is really access to markets. And that's where the U.S. And, and Israel probably share some of those barriers. Uh, these are transmission barriers. These are siting and permitting barriers. Project developers can't get to market if those issues aren't solved, and a lot of those are institutional. So I want to talk about that a little bit today. But the, the reason we're pursuing this is climate change. We're trying to take a world leadership position in climate change. President Bush launched the major economies meetings in September to try to help establish a goal that can be taken to uh, Copenhagen next year that would be a global goal. And it's important to recognize the growing economies in that process because if you uh, heard today, it's not so much uh, about the uh, overall supply and that supply and demand imbalance, but it's really the price signals that we're seeing, and that's all demand driven from China and India. And uh, this is really important because if you try to buy a solar panel today or a wind turbine panel today, you've got to wait. Again, demand is much greater than supply 
just like oil uh, is. So uh, the commodity prices that are going up, it's, it's mostly about energy prices and mostly about the increased demand that we're seeing from China and India. And as you know, renewable energy, the, the fuel's free. So th I think what the Chinese are realizing and, and everybody should realize is the technology's not a problem, especially in a place like Israel where there's lots of technology companies. The capital's not so much a problem. Lots of venture capitalists, entrepreneurs in Israel and the U.S. That's not the problem. I mean, but it's really the, the markets and what the government can do to incentivize it. But the, the big play here is, is manufacturing. And that's because the cost of renewable energy is fuels free. The cost is all the upfront capital cost of installation, which is really how many widgets you can produce in a given year. So a wind turbine cost are, are all the parts of a turbine. Solar panel costs, obviously, or how you manufacture that, the labor to put that panel together, the commodities and so forth. And of course, the more efficient you are, the less commodities you're using, you lower your prices. But so the manufacturing is really the key to renewable energy. And uh, we have some programs I'm going to talk about to address that. But uh, again, it's, it's really uh, this increased demand that we're seeing. So while our costs for renewable energy are decreasing, we're coming down the cost curve on solar. And there's a lot of low-cost solar that may not be efficient, but that doesn't really matter. Efficiency is overrated. It's really the cost that matters. There's always an efficiency trade-off with cost. But the cost is really what matters. We're coming down the cost curve on solar, but solar prices are going up a lot because of the policies that various governments have. Again, the demand is greater than supply. So we were in, a, in a, an inflection point here, and I think uh, as the price of and the volatility of fossil fuels keep going up and up and up, people will realize that uh, once you do the upfront investment, have the manufacturing from renewable energy, and if you have an offtake agreement, so you're selling power for 30 years, that power is going to be a flat price, only adjusted for maybe inflation and O&M costs, which are a lot lower in, say, a renewable energy plant like a wind farm or something compared to a nuclear reactor. You don't have feedstock or fossil fuel volatility, so you have flat electricity prices in the future. So that will be the attraction. Renewable energy may just be ex as uh, expensive uh, as fossil fuels today, but you're paying a flat price over 30 years or however long that, uh, that performance is guaranteed. And companies like Solel will say for 20 years, we'll guarantee 90% of uh, the performance the, the first day. So there's very, very little degradation in these solar plants. So the reason I'm here today is uh, myself and my boss, Assistant Secretary Karsner, uh, have, have signed an MOU with uh, Hesley Kugler, who is the Director General of the Ministry of Infrastructures here in Israel, to collaborate on technology like solar, biofuels, and other technologies that are going to uh, alleviate our dependence on fossil fuels, help us address climate change. And I think Hezi he is going to speak today. Uh, you know, again, Israel has the entrepreneurship. They have the, the, the technology. So a lot of the, uh, the barriers to renewable energy in Israel, you have the, the solar energy, is really some of these institutional things, these barriers to market. Uh, so what we're trying to do in the U.S. is to uh, look at all of these. Uh, we have lots of technology coming out of the pipeline. We have uh, about 10 to 15 national laboratories, and we're establishing entrepreneurs and residents at these labs. So we're bringing in private industry people to see what the laboratories have, and then how can they make a business case for that technology. And that's uh, somewhat similar to what's been done here in Israel with the universities, where there's venture capital funds for the technology developed in the universities. And I understand these have grown quite dramatically. So in a way, it's a, it's a form like that. So technology is, is not, not an issue. In the long term, there's technology that has to be proven out. But we have technology today, and I'll talk about how we're uh, making really good progress in the United States in installing technology. But where you don't have uh, technology proven out, it's hard to get financing. So when that excess to capital that I'm talking about, we have something called a loan guarantee program. And one of the sponsors here, BrightSource, has taken advantage of that program. This is where you have technology coming out of the pipeline. It's very hard to get that first financing. Once you get that first financing, 
than private uh, people finance you because they'll see the first one and you're just going to replicate that down the line. So this loan guarantee program basically uses the federal government's balance sheet to guarantee these loans, and they can be up to 80 percent of the project. So uh, in about uh, uh, two weeks, we're going to do another round of loan guarantees, uh, about $10 billion in renewable energy. And I really encourage uh, uh, Israeli uh, venture capitalists and developers to take advantage of that. The only requirement is it has to be innovative because we're not going to finance things that private markets would finance. And then the second, uh, the second criteria is it just has to reduce or eliminate greenhouse gases. And these have to be cited in the United States, but other folks can come in and uh, develop projects in the U.S. and take advantage of this loan guarantee program where they might have a hard time getting capital today. So we've had a lot of success. Um, I've been in the government for about 25 years, and, and never have we had, uh, you know, two energy policies within the space of two years. In fact, I think we went from 1992, 13 years, to 2005 before we had energy policy. But the 2005 energy policy in the U.S. was really, really critical to renewable energy. We have production tax credits that uh, last 10 years that offer two cents a kilowatt hour. And two cents a kilowatt hour, believe it or not, is enough to make wind competitive where we have good wind resources. So our wind industry has taken off, and, I, and I'll give you some numbers in a few moments. Uh, it also established our loan guarantee program that I just talked about, giving us authority to do that. Uh, and then we, last December, the President came to the U.S. Department of Energy to sign another energy bill, and that was related mainly to our dependence and our addiction to imported oil, and basically establishing mandates for biofuels. We have a renewable fuel standard that uh, dictates that we're going to have 36 billion gallons of biofuels by the year 2022. And uh, today's biofuels, of course, is corn-based. Ethanol is not driving up food prices. The price of oil and worldwide demand for food and commodities is driving up food prices. Now, 25% of our land is, that we use for corn is going to ethanol, so ethanol is driving up corn prices, there's no doubt. But corn prices today at $6 a bushel are, uh, once adjusted for inflation, are cheaper than any time before 1985 uh, in the U.S. So, so corn prices are up, but they're not up to where they've been in the past you know, over the last 60 years since we've been tracking this. Uh, so the corn prices are important to the first generation. There's no research and development and spent or money or government money spent in the United States on corn ethanol. It's all spent on cellulosic ethanol, which are basically energy crops that use very little, uh, very little fertilizer, very little water, and they have a great greenhouse gas benefit, uh, about 85 percent better than on a well-to-wheels basis than gasoline. So that's what we're really pushing in the United States. And the amount of ethanol produced from corn is capped at about 15 billion gallons in the law. The law also provides that uh, we sort of go down this road of biofuels with eyes wide open. There's checks and balances in terms of studies done by our National Academy of Sciences that look at water use, nutritional uh, needs throughout the world, indirect land use. A lot of the hot topics that you read about today are all in our law as a checks and balance so that we don't pursue a pathway that doesn't, that's not sustainable, that does not have the greenhouse gas benefits. So we feel very good that that is a well-written law and we're uh, proceeding ahead with that in biofuels. We think will be cost competitive, the cellulosic type, the non-food type of biofuels we have a program to make that cost competitive, unsubsidized by 2012. So we're literally talking uh, uh, less than four years away. We've also seen, because of uh, the recent policy, uh, dramatic growth in wind power. And uh, just uh, for a snapshot of that, in the year 2000, we've had about 2,500 megawatts of wind power in the United States. Last year, we led the world in installations of wind power, so we're up to about 17,000 megawatts. And just to put that in perspective, uh, the Israel peak power or the grid is about uh, 12,000 uh, megawatts. So we're at 17,000 megawatts, which is about 1% of the U.S. electricity. But that's a factor of six uh, since the year 2000. So these policies that are in place are really working. 
and uh, they're really critical to uh, sort of getting the industry up and running and establishing that manufacturing base. Last Monday, we issued a report. So we're at 1% wind, and we looked at the feasibility of what would it take to get 20% of our electricity from wind power. And uh, there's, there's no technological breakthroughs, this report says. Uh, basically, they come back to the market barriers that I talked about. Number one is transmission. Uh, getting transmission built in the United States is, is a huge hurdle. And of course, a lot, where a lot of the renewable resources are are remote areas. So you've got to have transmission from remote areas to where the people live in the demand center. So that's a critical hurdle. Siting and permitting are also big deals. And then, of course, it's getting that manufacturing base inst installed as well, because that's what's really going to control the cost of the wind power. So uh, we think that we can get there uh, by the year 2030, where 20 percent of our electricity is wind power. We had a similar story on, on solar uh, in terms of growth. In the year 2000, we had about 500 megawatts of uh, solar in the United States, and right now we're about 1,300 megawatts. So it's been a factor of about two and a half. And a lot of this was accelerated by a presidential initiative that's uh, focused on PV. So we wanted to make PV cost competitive with fossil fuel-based uh, electricity by the year 2015. And this is, again, on an unsubsidized basis. Right now, we're seeing lots of solar installations because, again, we have the tax policy in place, something called an investment tax credit, where somebody, a commercial operation, can get a 30 percent uh, tax break on the initial cost of the solar. So that's really helping that market take off. And uh, this uh, is important. Uh, we, we've also done a study. The U.S. uses about 1,000 gigawatts of power. We have solar thermal resources of about uh, seven, eight times that in the Southwest. So concentrated solar power, as you heard a lot about here today, is very important. And an area where Israel has a lot to offer in terms of companies like Solel and BrightSource. In fact, we, we visited Solel this morning, and uh, they have a tremendous uh, capability. And uh, really just looking, uh, they have the, the technology they have the financing, but then again, they're running in, far, in terms of installing in Israel, they need to address some of these market barriers that I'm talking about, like the United States, uh, transmission, siting, and permitting. They're really the roadblocks. So this is kind of an overview of, of where we're going in the U.S., and again, uh, we're, we're trying to lead the climate change process. Uh, again, we, we, we feel very strongly that technology is the answer for addressing climate change. And uh, with the, the price signals that we're seeing with fossil fuels, that's helping a lot in terms of renewable energy. It, it does uh, provide some pain to the economy, but it, it, at the same time, uh, it's, it's also an opportunity for these alternative technologies. So uh, while we have wind and solar that's very functional and guaranteed today, solar is guaranteed for 20, 30 years, depending on the company, a lot of technologies coming out of the pipeline are just going to keep driving that cost down. So we see uh, lots of potential for renewable energy. And it's been mentioned that intermittency is a problem, but uh, we're also addressing that. If the grid is bigger and you have multiple sources, uh, diversity is key to energy security because uh, if you have more diversity, then you reduce the volatility, of course, but you're not dependent on one source, like we pretty much are in transportation in the U.S., where 95 percent of it's oil. So uh, diversity is, is really the key here, and uh, uh, that will allow us uh, – what I meant to say is that grid integration is really important. So the bigger the grid is and you have energy storage, you can do wind and solar. Solar tends to be very good in terms of uh, being synchronized with peak demand. So that's not a problem. Wind is a little more uh, of an issue in integrating in the wind. But don't forget about geothermal technology. And uh, Israel has uh, not, not great resources in traditional geothermal technology called hydrothermal, where you drill and you try to hit hot water or steam. Uh, just not great resources. And the U.S. is pretty much uh, found the same thing, although we have some pretty good resources still in the West. But there's a technology called enhanced geothermal uh, technology. And a report was issued by MIT last year that I urge 
university folks to take a look at. This is uh, where you drill deeper. Instead of hitting a natural occurring reservoir of hot water or steam, you drill five to, uh, kilometers, possibly more, and then you engineer the reservoir. You fracture the rock. So then you put fluid down and you circulate that through the, uh, the, uh, the reservoir that you created through fracturing the rock. You bring that hot fluid back up to the surface, you create the power, and then you re-inject it back into the well. So it's kind of a closed loop, if you will. That's an area where we, th we think is very, very promising. And the importance of that is obviously the base load that you have so that you can uh, marry that up with the intermittent resources like wind and solar that are getting lots of attention. And uh, so I think in the future, uh, we're going to see more and more of our new generation being clean renewables. Right now, uh, well, I guess in 2004, uh, carbon-free sources or renewable sources were like 2% of our new generation. Wind last year alone was 30% of our new generation capacity. So we're growing capacity. Israel is going to grow in its needs over the years. So uh, renewable technology, I think, can fill all of that growth. I think if we're talking 1% or 2% a year, there's lots of potential for renewables to fill all of the growth. Uh, and that's, and I think that's practical because to think that we're going to take plants that are currently online that are providing a rate of return for investors offline is a very tough stretch, uh, especially if you're, you're talking about a coal plant that was built. Investors have paid off all their debt and everything. To think we're going to take those offline uh, abruptly is, is probably not pragmatic. So the way you address climate change is through efficiency and replacing any new capacity that you have with renewables or other clean energy sources. So we're, we're trying to work that. Uh, again, the renewables, we think wind can provide 20% of our electricity, and, we, and right now wind is 30% of new generation. So if we uh, marry that up with the prospects for concentrated solar power, which Israel has lots of industry capability, uh, we think the potential is to get 20% also uh, from concentrated solar power in the U.S. as well. So we're well in the way of uh, replacing all those new electrons with renewable-based uh, energy. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chok. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers of this session, and uh, I would like especially to mention the uh, contribution of Professor Krivus for organizing this session and being among uh, the key persons at Tel Aviv University behind the issue of renewable energy. I thank you all for attending this session. Uh, we will convene here at 5 o'clock after the break. Thank you very much.